Hello, I'm Christina Tobich with the Brooklyn Bridge Park Conservancy, and I'd like to wish you all a very happy National Reptile Awareness Day. In celebration of that, I'm excited to welcome you all to our evening talk, Community Conservation, Reptiles and Amphibians, which will feature Laura Heady from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and John Wenick from Project Terrapin. Though we are not able to meet in person, we want to acknowledge that Brooklyn Bridge Park is on unceded land of the Lenape peoples. And we want to pay respect to the Lenape community, their elders, both past and present and future generations. The species we will be discussing tonight are endemic to this area and are facing serious anthropogenic threats. Brooklyn Bridge Park Conservancy supports conservation efforts that are mindful of environmental justice initiatives. And it is important that we acknowledge the role that systemic racism and specifically the erasure and displacement of indigenous people has played in the making of and access to public green space. We're committed to examining how our organization and our programs can be more inclusive and incorporate more voices from black indigenous and people of color communities. Tonight's program focused on respecting and protecting local wildlife reminds us how important it is to also strive to advance equity, access and justice with regard to New York's public spaces and natural ecosystems. Both of our speakers have a wealth of experience in community-based conservation projects. We will hear from Laura Heady, who is the Conservation and Land Use Program Coordinator at the DEC Hudson River Estuary Program through partnership with Cornell University. Laura has 20 years of experience working on biodiversity initiatives in the Hudson River Estuary Watershed, creating programs and strategies to help communities, land trusts, and partners achieve successful conservation outcomes. She has an MS degree in biology with an emphasis in ecology from Idaho State University and a BS in environmental science from Rutgers University. Laura will be speaking to us tonight on her work with the Amphibian Migration Road Crossing Project. If you have any questions for our presenters, please type them in the Q&A box and we will be collecting these for a Q&A session with both speakers at the end. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you all to Laura. Thank you, Christina. Let me just uh, share my screen here. Let's see how this goes. Okay. And are you seeing my screen? Yes, we can see it. Great. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, and yeah, thanks, Christina. And thanks to uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park Conservancy for inviting me to be part of the reptile and amphibian theme month um, and to celebrate reptile awareness uh, day with amphibians joining the party. <laughs> um, I appreciate you all joining us. And um, as Christina said, I'm the conservation and land use program coordinator at the Hudson River Estuary Program through a partnership with Cornell. Um, and I'm really grateful for this time uh, to spend with all of you uh, talking about one of my favorite uh, groups of animals and habitats. And I'm hoping that despite the very challenging times that we've been in, that these uh, salamanders and frogs will make you smile. <laughs> um, so let's get started here. So tonight I'm going to be talking about um, our amphibian migration and road crossings project but framed around the uh, really remarkable biodiversity in the Hudson River estuary watershed. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the challenges that are facing uh, this group of amphibians that live in the forest in our watershed and the opportunities to address those challenges through local solutions. So I'll start first with uh, some background on the estuary program, the watershed where we work, uh, and then I'll introduce you to those amphibians that live in the forest and breed in woodland pools. So um, uh, our work at the Hudson River Estuary Program is um, unique within the Department of Environmental Conservation because we take an ecosystem-based approach. Uh, we focus on 
the entire Hudson River estuary uh, portion of the Hudson River, as well as its surrounding watershed. And we um, work collectively as uh, a staff to conserve um, six key benefits. And we work with a lot of different partners. And um, again, we work uh, throughout the watershed. And I'll show you a map in just a moment. But before I proceed, I just wanted to give the disclaimer um, that I'm not a herpetologist. Um, my familiarity with biodiversity in New York City is a little limited, um, but I've been working, as Christina said, on conservation initiatives in the watershed uh, just north of the city um, for almost two decades. And I do have a background in conservation and wildlife biology. But I primarily work uh, with municipalities and land trust partners um, and others in the watershed on uh, conservation planning. So you'll see, I'm, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit tonight as well. So um, here on the right is a map of the uh, estuary watershed shaded in blue. And um, uh, for those of you not familiar with the term watershed, I'm referring to the area of land and the waters uh, that all drain into the estuary. And the estuary is actually the tidal portion of the river. So the, the estuary portion of the Hudson River uh, receives tidal influence from the Atlantic Ocean. And that tidal influence goes all the way up to the dam in Troy, which is near Albany, which you can see at the northern um, part of the map with a little red dot, that's Albany there. And um, that stretch of tidal river or estuary is over 150 miles from New York Harbor all the way to the dam in Troy that prevents tidal influence from going any further north. That large watershed area is over 5,000 square miles. So it's a really large focal area for our program. Um, and for those of you who've ever spent time in the Hudson Valley, uh, you're probably well aware that we have a very diverse landscape. And so uh, as a result, we have a lot of biological diversity because we have everything from uh, mountains and ridges like the Catskill Mountains, the Hudson Highlands, the Rensselaer Plateau, um, to the lower um, elevation areas are different river uh, corridors and floodplains, forests, wetlands, meadows. And so all of that complexity uh, generates a lot of um, diversity right in the Hudson Valley. And since we're focusing on amphibians tonight, I wanted to point out that of all of the species of amphibians that occur across the state of New York, 85% are right here in the estuary watershed. So we really have a rich natural heritage and a stewardship responsibility to make sure those species are here um, for a long time into the future. So to give you a little bit of perspective on the watershed, um, I put a little arrow at the bottom of the map to show where approximately Brooklyn Bridge Park is in, in the lower end of the watershed. And there's me um, somewhere up in the kind of the mid Hudson Valley um, situated in the town of Ulster County or in, the, in Ulster County, um, very close to the confluence of Rondout Creek and the Wallkill River, which are two major tributaries of the estuary. So we're real, and I'm sure I, I recognize a few names in the participant list. So I know we're all pretty much scattered, I think throughout the watershed. So I'm gonna focus on an aspect of biodiversity in the Hudson Estuary watershed, um, specifically this evening, uh, forests and um, primarily woodland pool habitats. And the photo on the right, um, I'm sure you're familiar with forests, maybe not so much woodland pools. And yeah, so the photo on the right is a good example of a, a, a typical woodland pool. You may have heard the term uh, vernal pool and uh, woodland pool is kind of a specific uh, type of vernal pool in the forest. And that's important because the amphibians I'm going to be uh, talking about rely on these pools in the forest because that's where they live. They live in the forest. So what is a woodland pool? Um, woodland pools are seasonally uh, flooded wetlands, meaning that they only hold water for part of the year um, and they're in the forest. They're typically pretty small, maybe an acre or two in size, maybe a little smaller, maybe a little larger. Nature, you know, you can't put it all in black and white. Um, they're shallow, that's important. They're usually just a few feet deep um, with water. Um, and again, you know, maybe higher in early spring and, and um, getting, you know, shallower as the season goes on. And they sit in like a little isolated basin on the forest floor or a little depression. And if you, 
see in the um, kind of the back of the, the photo of the vernal pool or the woodland pool, there's a slope here. That's generally typical of the topography around a pool. They sit in this little depression that gathers um, snow melt, uh, rain, uh, rainfall, and um, storm water. And that's what fills the pool because usually they're, uh, typically there's no stream flowing in or out of the pool. So there's not a continuous um, source of water. And as a result, they dry up in summer. And this is key to the characteristics of a woodland pool. Because they dry up in summer um, or in typical years, they can't support fish. And that's really important. And it's why these pools provide critical breeding habitat for forest amphibians. Um, because um, being predator free makes these pools uh, excellent breeding habitat for the amphibians, um, for their eggs and their larvae and their tadpoles to develop without being uh, eaten by fish. Um, of course, they do provide food for some other wildlife, but the predation pressure isn't as great as if there were fish in the pool. And woodland pools also provide habitat for a lot of um, invertebrate species, uh, like fingernail clams and different aquatic insects. And they're also uh, an important water source for wildlife in the forest. Uh, so I wanted to share this set of photos because it really demonstrates the dynamic nature of um, the inundation of woodland pools. So the photo on the left um, uh, shows a very full pool. You can see the edge of the water it goes right up to the stand of trees in the forest. Um, and the pool on the right, or in the image on the right, is um, that same pool um, but almost dried up. And that's what you would normally see in late summer. And you uh, may have noticed in the photo, the trees have no leaves because this wasn't in the summer. It was actually in, um, it was late winter. And uh, unfortunately, it was a very dry winter. So there wasn't a lot of snow um, to melt into the pool. And it was a very dry kind of early spring. Um, and we didn't get the rains we normally get. So as a result, the pool held very little water even though it was the time of year when normally it would be full. And so um, I just want to point that out because um, it's, it's just a reminder of how closely uh, relate, uh, connected these pools are to precipitation. And when I talk about climate change later on, I just want you to keep that in mind. So as I mentioned, these pools are critical breeding habitat for a group of amphibians that live in the forest. And I'm gonna focus on um, uh, three of the four um, species that are considered really classic uh, woodland pool breeders and that are really dependent on these uh, woodland pools. I'm not gonna talk about one of them, which is marbled salamander, which is a gorgeous salamander, um, but they breed in the fall. And I'm gonna focus on our uh, late winter, early spring breeders. And they include spotted salamander on the left, wood frog, um, and on the right, um, the hybrid of the Jefferson and blue spotted salamanders, which are basically considered a complex because they're um, hybridizing so much, you can't really tell which um, is more predominant unless you're doing genetic testing. So um, I wanted to give you a sense of how common um, these species are in New York State, because as Christina pointed out, a lot of the animals we're talking about this evening are of conservation concern. But in this particular group, um, they're not threatened or endangered. But throughout the Northeastern United States, there are um, a lot of conservation initiatives to address the fact that, in general, their habitat is in decline and um, a lot of their uh, populations are not doing that well. But um, in the um, slide that you're seeing now, I, I grabbed some maps from the New York State Amphibian and Reptile or HERP Atlas Project website which is on the DEC um, website. This was an Atlas project done in um, the late 90s. So the data are now 20 years old, but it gives you a sense relatively of the distribution of these different species. So you can see spotted salamander and wood frog um, were observed in Atlas blocks by volunteers almost across the entire state, including um, parts of New York City and Long Island. Whereas the Jefferson blue spotted salamander complex is a little bit um, less common and um, it is actually New York State considered species of um, uh, conservation need. And um, just to share with you uh, some of the earlier stages of these species, the um, pools, you know, after breeding season and the adults go back into the forest, 
they're just left with all of this incredible life. Um, there's the egg masses and the tadpoles and larvae. So um, along the top of the slide, you can see there's an egg mass from spotted salamander and then um, examples of the salamander larvae. And one easy distinguishing characteristic that will help you know if you're looking at a salamander larvae versus a frog tadpole are those little fringy um, appendages uh, near their faces. Those are actually external gills, which is unique to salamanders and frogs don't, uh, the wood frogs don't have that. They have internal gills. And so, yeah, so the bottom photos uh, show an adult um, wood frog, a female that probably just laid eggs near these egg masses of other females because they tend to deposit their eggs in a big raft, a big congregation of egg masses. The middle photo is a close up of what the wood frog eggs look like as the little embryos are developing. And then on the bottom right, we see wood frog tadpoles. So you can imagine when all of this life is in the uh, woodland pool, it makes for great uh, foraging by some um, uh, more predaceous animals. And since it is Reptile Awareness Day, I did want to share one example of a species that does take advantage of uh, foraging in woodland pools and that's spotted turtle, which is one of, um, if I was to choose favorites, it's one of my favorite turtles in New York State. It's a beautiful um, semi-aquatic turtle that needs to move across the land um, during breeding season. And when it does, these pools make a great stopover point for uh, getting shelter and food. Um, and then I also wanted to share uh, one example of the many invertebrates that use woodland pools. And that's the fairy shrimp, which is um, a freshwater crustacean that's actually dependent on the uh, intermittent nature of woodland pools. They spend their whole lives in pools. They're only, you know, maybe about an inch um, in length. Um, but they actually require, uh, their eggs require a period of dry conditions and freezing conditions before they can even hatch. So they're really well adapted and, and rely on the, um, the inundation and drying of pools uh, as part of their life history. But getting back to the amphibians, um, I just wanted to drive home this point that uh, they live in the forest and they only move to these woodland pools for breeding for a couple of weeks and then they go back to the forest and that movement um, in, in conservation is what we refer to um, as you know really requiring habitat connectivity because we want them to be able to fulfill all stages of their life cycle um, as safely as possible and moving across the landscape when you're you know a two inch long frog or a five inch or eight inch long salamander can be very dangerous um, as you might imagine. Um, uh, so let me give you a little scenario here to help you visualize um, what migration uh, might look like. So uh, this very simplified image is not to scale. You know, those black areas are woodland pools. This is an air photo. Um, it was an air photo uh, taken during the summer. So the trees have leaves on them, which would not be the case during migration, which would happen during leaf off season. Um, but it's just to help, you know, help you visualize the, um, the migration. So you have all of these amphibians in the winter that are hunkered down uh, in the ground. In particular, the Jefferson blue spotted salamanders and the spotted salamanders are in burrows of um, small mammals like shrews. And the wood frogs are frozen um, and hunkered under you know, tree logs and uh, or fallen logs and rocks and so forth. And they're basically waiting for the conditions to be, to be right for them to um, take off on their breeding migrations. And when does that happen? In the Hudson Valley, migration um, occurs usually in March and April. And throughout their range, migration generally occurs um, on rainy nights because they need the moisture to keep their skin moist. It happens after the ground has thawed and when evening temperatures stay above 40 degrees. So it happens at night. Uh, the migrations happen uh, when it's raining usually. And, um, and so basically they're just um, awaiting these conditions. And if everything lines up just so, you'll get these explosive migrations that are often referred to as big night migrations where hundreds and thousands of amphibians will be on the move. So, um, and just to point out, if you can imagine if that many amphibians are all moving um, at once, it means that local populations can be especially vulnerable all at the same time. And so that's a good segue into talking about conservation challenges. 
So while some migrations happen, you know, deep in the forest, thanks to the conservation and stewardship efforts of um, state and uh, municipal agencies and land trusts and, and landowners, um, often, unfortunately, especially in a developing area like the Hudson Valley, many amphibians actually need to cross roads um, on their breeding journey. And the, now you see these three species that were all photographed on the road uh, during migration. And um, they're very vulnerable when they're out on roads because of vehicles moving through. And research has shown that even in low traffic areas, there can be significant mortality. So to add to that conservation challenge, in that large uh, 5,000 square mile estuary watershed, there are approximately 20,000 miles of roads. Now, of course, all of those roads are not uh, travel, or you know, are not all in areas of high quality habitat. But we don't actually know where all of the places uh, migrations are crossing uh, roads. Um, but you know, here gives you gives you an example. Even in a rural area, here we have a forested area, and these are woodland pools in the yellow circle. And if you're an amphibian living south of this road, you would need to move across that road to get to the pools and then to get back to the forests. And again, even in low traffic areas, there can be high mortality. So this idea of needing to move about the landscape. Um, is again a really important issue when thinking about how to conserve habitat and how to conserve this habitat complex that's required by these different species. And in the image here, um, this is from Aram Calhoun's um, guidance on conservation buffers for woodland pool breeding species. We see a wood frog with the actual little radio um, uh, transmitter on its back. And thanks to some research, they recognize that not only are wood frogs moving between the breeding pools uh, in the late winter and spring and upland forest, they're also moving to, um, uh, to uh, swamp areas. And so depending on the time of year, they utilize different parts of the upland or wetland forested areas. So um, that's something you know, that again demonstrates this need to move about the landscape. Also their research and research of many others has shown that a lot of these pool breeding amphibians uh, travel as much as 750 feet, as much as a mile or more uh, to reach their non-breeding habitat after mating and egg laying is done. And so what we want to do in conservation is avoid fragmenting habitat. Ideally, we want these large areas of contiguous habitat. And for this group of species, we want forest with uh, woodland pools uh, in that forest and we don't want to fragment the landscape into smaller pieces that are divided by development and roads and driveways, um, because not only for amphibians, you know, it happens for turtles, it's true for mammals, trying to move across that fragmented landscape can be very dangerous. So how do we ensure their habitat needs are met? Because we can't go out and just buy up all of the land. There's not enough conservation financing for that. Um, only so much can be protected in parks and preserves. So I wanted to share with you what um, uh, was one of the challenges here up in the estuary watershed. So I now have a new map on the right that shows the green area is our watershed. And overlaying on that now are the 10 counties that border the estuary. And there in those 10 counties are 261 individual cities, towns, and villages, each with their own local government, each with their own planning and zoning boards, all making individual uh, land use decisions. That's called home rule, that they each get to make their own decisions. So you can imagine trying to coordinate conservation across all those different political boundaries can be really difficult. Uh, on top of that, most of the watershed is actually in private ownership. So you also have landowners making decisions. So that's why it's so important to raise awareness and why I'm so grateful for um, the Brooklyn Bridge Park Conservancy for having a chance to talk about this tonight and, and let more people learn about this. Um, so education is really important. The other issue uh, that's a big conservation challenge is that uh, woodland pools are generally unprotected by state and federal wetland uh, regulations. And that's because of their small size uh, and their isolation makes them pretty much fall through the regulatory cracks. So they're very vulnerable. And I would be remiss if I didn't just point out again, this idea that climate change is going to be most likely an increasing um, challenge for this particular habitat type. Um, you know, on the left, you see a typical woodland pool in the summer dried up as you would expect. On the right, we see a pool in early um, spring 
with the ice just starting to melt, which we would expect. But as we see more erratic weather, intense storms happening during weird times of the year, blizzards happening in you know spring, drought happening, uh, less snowpack melting into the pools, uh, there's concern that there won't be enough water um, in the pools held long enough to enable the life cycle of these um, amphibians to continue um, with uh, you know their breeding. So many challenges. Um, and just to sum up, you know, it's habitat loss and degradation, it's road mortality during migration and climate change are some of the top concerns uh, for this particular group of amphibians. So let's think about what some of the solutions are. And I'm really gonna focus on uh, some of the more local solutions because there's global issues affecting amphibians like you know, disease and environmental pollution. But I'm trying to focus on what we can impact in our um, sphere of influence. So one of the things that um, we've been doing, I started this project in 2009, the Amphibian Migrations and Road Crossings Project. Uh, and this was a volunteer initiative that was designed to really raise awareness like we're doing tonight, um, help people understand the importance of these habitats, help them get excited about biodiversity, and also recognize the impacts of how we change land and how we sever connections between habitats. Of course, we want to provide a rewarding volunteer experience, help people feel connected to nature. Um, and then with all of those volunteers um, that go out, that enables us to uh, locate road crossings across this very large geographic area. And they can help reduce road mortality by helping move amphibians on these few migration nights. Um, and, and that hopefully will um, enable us to identify opportunities to better conserve local populations build support then for community conservation initiatives. And then um, as our data um, become uh, stronger, we can hopefully create a foundation for researchers to ask questions about the migration, to study some of these species and use our data for that. And um, so what do our volunteers do? Well, first they have to really follow safety measures because they're out on the roads at night in the rain when conditions are not great. Um, but they're, they're an amazing group of people. I'm so grateful that they go out and they do this. Um, they document where road crossings are and they um, help reduce mortality. And they fill out data forms to document the conditions of the weather, the traffic, and they count live and dead amphibians. And so just to give you a sense of uh, some highlights of the accomplishments in the last 12 years um, with a focus on, you know, again, raising awareness, engaging volunteers, documenting the migration um, and reducing mortality, we've had um, 552 um, volunteers in the watershed devoting almost 1500 hours of their volunteer time. And collectively, there's been over 30,000 amphibians counted. About a third of those, unfortunately, were dead from um, being run over by vehicles. Um, but successfully, over 17,000 amphibians have been assisted moving across the road. Um, there's about six species that are most commonly seen, but overall, 20 different species have been observed in the last 12 years. And in terms of raising awareness, over 1,200 people subscribe to the project email list, and there's been lots of outreach and lots of publicity, everything from radio, public service announcements to lots of articles and newspapers, which helps um, reach the, the broader public with um, information about the project. Um, and so who can participate? Anyone can participate, um, anyone in the estuary watershed. Um, so uh, we're again, focused on the Hudson Valley as part of the Hudson River Estuary Program. But anyone can learn about the project because all of the information is available on the DEC website. You could just Google amphibian migrations and road crossings project. And there's lots of information. We have um, a video about the project. We have links to recorded YouTube trainings. Uh, so you can listen to a presentation. Uh, we have the volunteer handbook, identification guidance, and so forth. I mean, most people who participate are actually self-taught and uh, they'll learn from the uh, materials that are on the web and then they'll go out with a friend or um, a, you know, a family member. And I've also just recently been coordinating more with local groups to help get them involved in um, organizing locally. So some land trusts, 
and community groups have been helping um, with more local coordination, which is wonderful. And I just wanted to end with pointing out that in addition to that project, um, really most of what the work I do is focus on um, conservation planning and working with those local municipal officials. And there is guidance out there to try to um, uh, successfully achieve conservation of not only the woodland pools, but also the critical buffers around them and the associated upland forested habitat. And there's still research you know, happening that's helping us better understand what the needs are. But I just wanted to point out that there, um, you know, there is guidance to try to encourage better planning that will accommodate the needs of this group of species. And if you're interested in kind of local conservation planning, I just wanted to make a plug for our new website, which just launched um, last month. And it includes um, a real in-depth look at conservation planning in the estuary watershed. Everything from biodiversity and conservation priorities to um, uh, conservation planning, different techniques, different examples from communities in the Hudson Valley. There's uh, links to different mappers and data. Um, and it really just emphasizes the fact that so many different people in our communities have a role to play in making sure all this incredible biodiversity is here for many generations to come and that this amazing land and these amazing waters and the habitat that they provide um, continue to thrive. So I encourage you to check out our website and you can dig in a little bit deeper on these topics. And of course, you could always um, reach out to me if you have any questions about anything you find on the website. So I'm going to end there because this is National Reptile Appreciation Day and we need to let the, um, the Diamondback Terrapins uh, have a starring role here tonight. But um, I wanna thank you so much for uh, your interest in the project and, and in this topic and um, look forward to some of the discussion and Q&A uh, later on um, in the webinar. Thanks. Great, thank you, Laura. Um, I really enjoyed that and um, it made me think about the fact that here in New York City, uh, we're, we're dealing with a lot of issues of habitat loss here. Uh, just some interesting facts for uh, everyone out there, roughly about 85% of the coastal wetlands um, around the New York, New Jersey Harbor estuary have been lost, as well as um, well over 90% of the freshwater wetlands in New York City have been lost in the last century. And, those freshwater wetlands, that's, that, these are these areas that Laura's talking about, that, that includes vernal pools and all these areas that the amphibians will migrate to to lay their eggs. Um, so good things for us here in New York City as well to start thinking about more and talking about uh, initiatives we can be taking. Uh, I would like to uh, now introduce our next speaker, uh, but before I do that, just a reminder that we do have a Q&A box. We're going to take some time at the end uh, for both speakers to come back on video and answer some questions. So if you have any lingering questions for Laura or for our next presenter, uh, feel free to type those in as they come up. Now, I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker. I have a little bit of a soft spot for the uh, animal that's going to be highlighted. Dr. John Wenick is the research coordinator for Project Terrapin, which is based in New Jersey. Project Terrapin's initiatives take place throughout Barnegat Bay, and John has worked with Terrapins at Island Beach State Park and North Sedge Island since 2002. He is also the science supervisor at the Marine Academy of Technology and Environmental Science, which is a specialized high school in Manahawkin, where he directs the Terrapin Research and Barnegat Bay Student Grant Program. John is working on diamond terrapin, terrapin conservation projects, as well as mentoring undergraduate students on various projects related to terrapins, habitats, climate change, and natural resources at Barnegat Bay, New Jersey. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to John. Thank you, Christina. And thank you to everybody at the Brooklyn Bridge Park um, Conservancy for letting uh, me present this on the Terrapins tonight. And uh, following up too with Laura um, and her excellent presentation, we, we kind of share the same kind of threats with Terrapins where we are. So I'm gonna share this and we'll get started. 
one. Let me go back a couple here. Jumped ahead a little bit. All right. So we're going to talk about the Diamondback Terrapins. Uh, I work in an area um, in Barnica Bay, New Jersey, Central Jersey. I have a map coming up, uh, but I have some of the contact information here, um, and you know we'll get into that. And that's the Barnicket Lighthouse. So that's a good view that we have from one of our study sites all the time. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of overview on Diamondback Terrapins. Then I'm going to talk about threats, and then I'm going to talk about some of the conservation actions um, that we employ. Um, to try to deal with some of these threats. And some of these threats are definitely synonymous with the terrapins across the range. And uh, we have a species called the Northern Diamondback Terrapin, which uh, extends all the way north from the Carolinas up into Massachusetts. So they're definitely found in the New York area um, if you were to find a terrapin um, you know, around uh, some of the places like Jamaica Bay and so forth. Um, this gives a map, a distribution. There's seven recognized like subspecies of terrapins, uh, four genetic uh, variations, but seven geographic uh, subspecies. And once again, we're in the northern reaches and they're found along the Atlantic coast and the Gulf coast of the United States. And they're endemic only to those areas um, throughout the entire Western hemisphere. So they're the only turtle species that lives exclusively in an estuary um, in the whole entire Western hemisphere. There are a couple in the uh, Eastern hemisphere that do that as well. And once again, salt marshes are very important down in Southern Florida. Um, they live in some of the mangrove uh, wetlands areas. Um, very well adapted for swimming, much like many other aquatic um, turtles. Um, they have web feet with um, um, little extensions or claws. Um, they can come up and nest, that's females, and dig into the sand very well. And they're very good swimmers. Um, so they can go after their prey items, which are almost anything that you could find in, in an estuary um, in terms of like their diets. Um, top shell, technically we call it the carapace, the bottom shell is the plastron. Um, and that's, that's true for all you know, turtle species overall. But the terrapins, um, once again, they're, they're endemic to estuaries and they have very different patterns. So you'll see throughout my presentation, some of our pictures, um, their shell patterns and their colorations could vary. Um, and that's what actually makes them um, a little more attractive um, sadly, for the pet trade and other other means of um, threats to them as well. There is a difference between males and females. Um, males tend to be smaller than females. Females grow larger. Um, they have to contain the eggs or lay the eggs um, for future um, generations, so forth. Um, so it takes longer for the females to, to reach those sizes. So the maturity could be, in our area, we found some that are around seven years, sometimes a little bit longer, whereas males um, they could be, you know, much smaller. And there's a good depiction on the bottom left um, of a terrap uh, terrapin picture by Willem Rosenberg, who does a lot of work with them. And you can see that clear difference between the male on the top and the female that he's kind of holding up. So there is a, a difference in, you know, their not only sizes, but also where they occupy certain habitats. Uh, when the females do come up and lay eggs, um, their, their clutch or the reproductive output, how many eggs they, they lay, could, could vary. And we found in our area that they could come back three times in the same season. So that's three clutches of eggs they can, they can produce in the same season. But that's rare. Um, it, it's not common. Um, so it, it's not a high percentage of females that do that. It's a very low percentage of females that come up three times. Um, and also there's a range of the number of eggs in a clutch. Um, we're not too convinced. We've seen two, but we, we feel that the two may be a female that incompletely laid eggs previously, and then she came back to, to disperse or finish laying the um, eggs that she had left. But sometimes they may get scared off. Um, we're, you know, so we've seen that before. So the two is, is kind of in the low range, but we've seen as high as 22 in this area. And if you go more north, um, you tend to get a greater clutch size um, in this species. And this is what the eggs would look like within the egg cavity on the right. I have the eggs, you know, uh, we, we take them out, we measure them in a couple project areas that we work with. Um, this is an, uh, an egg. These are eggs exposed from an area that was predated um, where we do some of the work in Barnica Bay. But you can see the area that they nested, um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much, we have sandy soils, but they'll lay eggs anywhere that they could, they could come up and access. So that's one of the issues that we're dealing with. 
is that they come up onto people's properties, um, you know, travel along roadsides to get to um, higher ground to nest, and, and that's a that's a threat. And uh, we try to assess, you know, assess um, the reproductive output of females. So some areas, like North Sedge Island where we work, we we can work with the same females and we can kind of assess the reproductive output each year to see if it maintains itself. Then in about 60 days or so, um, the eggs will incubate and the hatchlings will emerge. So if it's a warmer, drier summer, they usually are out within 60 days. If it's a little bit cooler and wetter, um, they will emerge a little bit later and the temperature of the nest will dictate if they're actually males or females. If it's a warmer nest, um, we'll get more females. If it's a cooler nest, um, more males. And, and the medium temperatures around the, we did in Fahrenheit, like around the low 80s in Fahrenheit. So if it's low 80s to mid 80s, we'll, we'll start to see more females. And if it's below that, we'll start to see more males emerge. And some of the threats, um, um, crab pots. Um, so we get these um, sometimes they're referred to as um, overnight pots or crab traps where they're set in the waters and then a bait's put in the middle and then whoever sets some kind of leaves or they could leave for a day or more and attract blue crabs, that's the target. But if they're put in areas where they're terrapins, the terrapins will eat, you know, whatever's the bait, but they'll also sometimes eat the blue crabs and be attracted to them as well. And if they can't get up to get air, they'll drown. So terrapins have um, lungs much like us. Um, they could stay submerged for a period of time, but in the summertime, they're probably not able to survive a full tidal shift. So if this pot is even left down for a number of hours, um, there's a good chance that the terrapins are not gonna survive, they may drown. On the top right um, is a picture of um, a fishing means or a way that they would collect uh, fish using a fight net. And this was taken down in Maryland in the early to mid 2000s, this picture. Um, but this was a net that was not maintained and it was left out there and then terrapins accessed it. And then what happened was um, they had a high mortality because this was left out for a long period of time and um, you know, attracted more and more turtles. So that's a horrid scene. And that actually led to Maryland shutting down um, a harvest for terrapins that they, they had um, that was, I, I guess that, that um, was changed by their legislature back in uh, the mid 2000, 2006. And then sadly enough on the bottom right, um, or vehicular you know, um, type mortalities that we see um, from, from different places like causeways leading out into the marsh systems where, where the females are coming up to, to nest. Um, and that's a, that's a problem along our coastal area. And if you head even down south into some places in Southern New Jersey, like Cape May, um, they, they even have a greater problem with this. So our work. Um, well, we work in central New Jersey. Um, like I said, we're from Barnicut Bay. Um, so Barnicut Bay runs right along basically the entirety of the coast of Ocean County, um, which is in central Jersey. And what I did was, it looks a little busy, but we have our different, what we call study site locations that are being monitored not only by us, by some of our partners, some of our affiliates that we worked with in the past, um, and also, um, you know, we're working with um, people at the U.S. level, but we're also working with um, um, those biologists that are at the state level as well. Because one of the things when I started doing this work back in the early 2000s, I asked a simple question, like, what's the population of terrapins in Barnicut Bay? Uh, we were working on conservation initiatives at Barnicut Bay, not so much related to terrapins. And one such area was maintained by uh, New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife. And I noticed that terrapins were coming up to nest. So I inquired and there was no data to um, show any type of populations of terrapins at Barnicut Bay and very little that showed any population uh, work with terrapins across the entire state. Um, in New Jersey, they're considered a, a species of special concern um, and or will be designated that it's still pending. Um, in other states around us, they're basically special concern but they're not threatened or endangered. Um, but however, their habitat's declining and so forth. But what we did was we embarked upon trying to learn about populations, you know, in, in a more of a micro scale, looking at Barnicut Bay in different regions within the bay. Um, so there's a lot of groups that are working in these different areas because it's very hard to maintain all of this. But 
we also do a lot of um, some mark and recapture work. And right now, just based upon our partners and some of the work that we've done, we're, we're in excess of about 6,000 terrapins that are marked in the Barnicut Bay system. Um, so that's what we're doing. I wanted to put this slide in into, into, I had it at the end and I said, I wanted to move it up because it's really about um, all of the individuals over the years that have supported to make this project work um, across the whole entire region. And it's also, you know, volunteers that work with all the different um, types of programs, you know, throughout our area and even up, you know, into where we're presenting with the Brooklyn Bridge Park Conservancy. Um, it, it's just um, been challenging um, this year more than ever, and everybody knows that, but we were still able to get it done. We have a family up on the top right um, that volunteered throughout the whole entire summer to do observations uh, for us and, and uh, at one of our study sites, and you know, I'm so thankful to them and some of our interns that had the practicing, you know, strict distancing where we would work together more in a team, like on the top left picture, um, you know, the bottom, the bottom picture kind of indicated what we had to do this year, but we have a population that we really want to monitor every year. So it was important for us to continue the study. And I wanted to just acknowledge that and all volunteers that work on these, you know, type of projects, especially since we're talking about amphibian and, and reptile awareness. So one of our study sites, Cedar Run Dock Road and Cedar Bonnet Island um, are areas that are in Barnicut Bay. Uh, one is highly developed and the other is an area where they're taking, they have taken material and filled it in to build up Cedar Bonnet Island. And we're doing some monitoring work there. And to do that kind of work, we capture individuals. Sometimes we get them um, through hand captures if they come up on the roadway. Uh, sometimes we use hoop traps. Um, so um, in a two year period of time, we were able to collect 600 terrapins you know, on the Cedar Run site, but we give all the terrapins a certain code. Um, you can see the, the letters up on, on that uh, magnetic board. Um, and what we do is, we also take blood samples and I'll get into the coding in a little while. Um, we, we take measurements and look at their health. Um, that's important to us as well to see if there's um, any types of fungus um, that are on their shell, um, note kind of anomalies in their shell patterns. And we also you know, look at their claws and limbs and, 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 and just shell fitness overall. Um, sometimes it's a, it's a it's a task because you can go out and find you know a number of them at one time, so uh, we try to collect them in GPS where they are. So you have to kind of balance out the GPS and uh, also collect the terrapins at the same time. And we were able to take them back to our laboratory and kind of mark them. This was last year. And one of the questions we get um, is we use a passive integrated transponder tag or pit tag that gets inserted um, into the animal. They do that with domestic cats and dogs as well, same, same concept, and you can kind of scan them and they have their own individual code. But we, over the years, have notched our terrapins. Um, we have, have done this by using um, a system where we use these outer plates or scoots, we call them, and we give them a designation of the alphabet. And typically there's 24, so we can go from A to X and each gets a unique code so that we put a little file mark in it. Now it's made, the material that their shell is made from contains carotene and the blood vessels don't extend out that far. So it's like us basically trimming our fingernails, um, but it also gives them a permanent mark. And one of the debates we had are to notch or not to notch, but in New Jersey, um, I'd say within the past seven years, we've had two major incidents where a number of terrapins were taken um, one was legal one of the years because we still had um, a harvest in place and some of the terrapins were sold down in Maryland to an aquaculture venture that was breeding them and then trying to get uh, permission from U.S. Fish and Wildlife they applied for um, an extension on the CITES agreement so that they could sell them um, overseas. Um, and when U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service investigated, they found that those terrapins were about that 3,500 number um, was from that incident. Then the second one happened more recently when the terrapins actually in New Jersey were protected. Um, it became a state law a few years back and signed by former, uh, former Governor Christie to ban the harvest on terrapins. And after the fact, an, um, an individual um, was cited with taking, once again, there's that number, 3,500 terrapins and um, selling them. So 
for us, we feel that our system of notching, which helped us to identify if we had uh, worked with that turtle before or not, or captured that turtle before, we feel that it gives, it gives the turtles a little more protection in New Jersey because if someone were likely to try to take them for the illegal pet trade or, or breeding or whatever, um, they would see these marks and it may dis dis discourage them. Now, could they have a portable reader to see if they had a fit tag or not? Possibly, but at least this is some kind of visual identification that someone could see up front and say, where did these terrapins come from? So um, one of the things I wanted to do is just give a quick um, story about a terrapin that was taken. Uh, we called her Bailey. She got that name because we had a social media uh, contest. She was taken from a population in the Great Bay. Um, and she was taken, we think, maybe about three years ago or so. They're not certain, but we figured 2017 may have been the time frame. But she was originally marked by us in 2008, had her code, and that's her code on that yellow scanner you could see on the bottom right. Um, she was found again in 2013 by a study with Conserved Wildlife Foundation in New Jersey. Um, she was then reported back to us from Maine. So in that time, she actually went from our, our study site, we, we figure around 2017, and was found in Maine in 2019. It was by a veterinarian who scanned it and found this, this code, and I'll go back to the code again, there was no one familiar up in that area because terrapins only extend up into Massachusetts. So they contacted individuals in Massachusetts that didn't have any recollection of that code or it didn't fit into their system. And when they put it out to us and, and other people along the coast that do studies, that one you know, matched up to our system. And as a result, she was returned back to New Jersey and she's put into an area right now where she's getting um, a, a proper setup and care. And we're assessing her and the population that we may be releasing her back to. So that is her population that she came from to check the health of those individuals and hers. And we're happy to report um, the individual she's with, all of them tested negative for certain types of bacteria. And then in the wild population, um, it, there wasn't anything that was out of the ordinary, like some of the um, you know, uh, ranaviruses and so forth that are there. Uh, some of the injuries we deal with are boat propellers. Um, that's what happens here. Um, flooding that actually um, that actually um, floods over their nesting habitat. Um, a lot of this flooding used to take place during the winter time in which many of the turtles emerged and they, they overwintered or found areas that overwinter. So this may be less impactful at that time. But now what's happening is that some terrapins are staying in the nest cavity and we're seeing more of these flood events more regularly. Some of them even during the summer months. And we've had one in this study area, this is my Cedar Run site. And you can see that that was a roadway actually where that, that house looking, that's a restaurant on the left-hand side kind of went all the way down along the road. So that's something that we're aware of. Um, we're, we're monitoring where these terrapins are, are going. So we're putting data loggers on them and retrieving them the next year. Just uh, some, some information. This is a, a box of, um, uh, we call it the urine life of terrapins. This is the depth at which the terrapins were, were diving. This was one that was marked. Rumation is the um, form of hibernation. So they, the females, and this was a female we marked, went deep into the muds um, in the winter time. But this is showing like the way the tides go out and, in, and the water depth that these terrapins were exposed to when they were kind of buried or this one was buried. BHIO is just her code. Um, so that, that's one. And then this just shows the temperatures that she was exposed to. And I can get in, you know, into more of that if anybody wants to talk about that separately. But that's, that's something that we're doing with these archival data tags so we can learn more. But some of the conservation efforts are really important. You saw that flooded out area. So what we're trying to do is go to areas where terrapins cross roadways and try to enhance those areas to prevent the terrapins from crossing the roadways and provide them with optimal nesting uh, material. So we still, we're putting in these, we, we title them turtle gardens. We actually coined that phrase from Wellfleet, Massachusetts that, that started this type of project and, and uh, they gave us permission to, to, to use that same term. And we're working in areas in central New Jersey with different partners that are starting to create these, uh, we call nesting areas. And 
some of the areas we document, of course, we document their success. That's something we want to do. Some areas we actually put these covers over. So we are, you know, stepping in a little bit more to provide them more protection, but that allows the hatchlings to escape and keeps raccoon and other predators. We even have a fox that are predators too. Um, so these are some areas and we, we look at hatch success and um, number of age hat, hatched. Um, another threat we have that I mentioned before with the crab pots, we have a project where we're, we're taking up derelict crab pots in Barnicut Bay. Um, from a four year stretch, we removed about, you know, basically close to 2,200 um, items from the bay that were threats. Uh, we even studied the movement of crab pots because if they're, they're, they're left or abandoned out there, they're called ghost pots. And then any type of storm or anything could kind of move them. And we also looked at ways that we could keep terrapins from going into these crab pots as well. And here's just some pictures of some of the crab pots that recovered you know, along the shoreline. Those closer to the shoreline are a little bit more um, attractive to terrapins because um, if they're out in the middle of the bay, it, it's a little more harsh. Closer to the shoreline or closer to the marshes especially, uh, we found uh, the remains of a number of terrapins out there. I'm just gonna go through. Matter of fact, on the right-hand side, there's a crab pot we pulled up and those are the remains of um, some terrapins. We pulled these crab pots up, I would say, in the month of January, February, which means that these terrapins may have accessed it just before they were going into their brumation, which is that form of winter hibernation. Um, and here's, sadly enough, a crab pot that just was found um, recently, which means this past summer, um, at a field location um, off of Barnicut Bay. And this one was abandoned. You see, it looks like a boat must have run over the crab pot or, or whatever, but they pulled it up. Um, we could tell the remains of crab pots, uh, I mean, the remains of terrapins in the crab pots because their, their bottom plastron, which is that bottom shell, when they, when they um, die, the bones disarticulate as they break down. And that forms like a hook is the area where their kind of legs go into the shell. There's a connector between the top and bottom shell called the bridge, and it forms this kind of um, L shape. So we can look at the unique orientation and patterns of those to find out how many terrapins were in a crab pot, if that's what remains, because that gets caught on the mesh of the crab pot, even if we pull it up. And what happens is we can actually measure that. And um, some research from uh, Ben Atkinson, who did this work, will give us a relationship of the size of the, uh, of the individual that went in at the time. So that's the area we're talking about. And if we're, we're talking about like trying to prevent terrapins from getting in. So we have these inserts called BRDs, bycatch reduction devices. And uh, we assessed on one crab pot, we caught 17 or captured 17 females that were dead in the crab pot. And we, we assessed that if we had that bycatch reduction device that was the New Jersey size, it would have excluded um, those 10 individuals from, from possibly getting into that crab pot. So we, we work on studies that look at different prototypes or designs. So the, um, the A and B are a South Carolina design that's a little like an optical illusion because it looks so much smaller. And then a C is the New Jersey length um, that's two inches by six inches. And D is um, the length that they use down in Maryland, which is about four and a, uh, four and a half inches by an inch and three quarters. And we, we, we look at um, not only the effectiveness of these keeping out um, terrapins, which it, which it has worked, any crab pot using any of the inserts, we actually conducted a study and we found that there were no bycatch items. However, we're also looking at crab catch. And this is a study we conducted and, um, and just for, for, for the sake that smaller beard, they actually captured more legal size crabs, which is a legal size for New York, New Jersey and Delaware using that smaller insert, it actually retained more of the smaller crabs. So one of the things I can say, what, can, what, what, can, what you can do to help and what, you know, um, if you're crabbing, you know, which is becoming more popular, even up into Massachusetts, um, we're working with some of our partners. Um, there's, a great, there's a great site called Rig It Right, where you kind of outfit the crab pot in a safer way using these inserts. Um, also look for workshops. I put virtual now, a proper crab pot usage and education. If you have crab pots, check them all the time. You know, um, that's important too. And that's a, a rig it right kind of kit for crab pots. What else can be done? Installation of more turtle gardens. Um, I think that's like an important thing. We're gonna have, we're gonna, in response to climate change and sea level rise, we're gonna need to really look at some of these habitats. Um, and we're gonna need to um, 
look at elevations and, and how that may affect the survivorship of, of these coastal nesting species. That even includes coastal nesting birds. Um, supports e support efforts like beach grass planting that actually helps to keep dunes in place. Um, there's, there's projects that make nest covers for reduction in certain areas and, and road crossing signs. Um, that ties really well into the amphibian project that, you know, working on making people more aware, you know, that there are amphibians and reptiles, you know, that are, that are transversing or needing to cross those roadways. And then I also always want to give a shout out to our wonderful partners that we're working with down here, um, you know, on some of these projects that, that have like amazing volunteers that really make this all work. And like I said, support, you know, programs like the Brooklyn Big Parks Conservancy and Amphibian Migration and Road Crossing Project. Um, they're doing some great things. And this is what we do at Project Terrapin as well. Um, we have a Head Start program. That's a whole other side thing that we do with schools. And we have a big release day. And we have our students where I work that form, you know, a larger group called Project Terrapin with different divisions that go out and table and uh, promote signs like this is one of our initiatives where we put lawn signs out instead of you know some campaign signs we actually every season ask residents to put out signs like this and we're working with one of the communities on getting them out to as many people as they can in their community and all this wouldn't be possible without the support of all these wonderful uh, programs and partners throughout the year so thank you um, for for listening and uh, i hope we were able to, to share some information about terrapins with you Alrighty, Haley is going Hi. to be hopping on. Sorry. Your... There she is. All right, let me fix this. Slid a little bit. All right, can you see me? Okay, thank you so much. Sorry, my um, internet's been a little weird. Thank you, John. My name is Haley McClanahan, uh, and I was going to pull some questions for both you and Laura. Um, if you're still watching with us, you can ask questions on either platform um, and we will get those into the panelists. Um, I just wanted to say that I know that reptiles and amphibians are facing threats worldwide, especially a lot of amphibians. And it's so great to hear that even though the species in New York areas, the amphibians that Laura was speaking of are um, not of immediate concern, um, projects like yours working on this are gonna make sure that they stay that way. Um, and I really loved the picture of the little salamander on the field notes. Um, that was really cool. Uh, <clears throat> so, and nice to hear that um, your volunteers are still so committed, um, even through everything that's been going on this year. I was interested to see how um, your projects were affected by the pandemic. And John, you spoke about that a little bit. I was wondering if Laura, you had anything you wanted to share. Sure, so, um, and yeah, thank you. And thanks, John, that was really interesting. So much great work happening. Um, but about COVID, yeah. So the migration in the Hudson Valley this year actually happened before COVID really hit hard so that, you know, it, um, some of the volunteer work was happening before we knew really what was going on and before social distancing and mask wearing had become the norm. Um, but as it moved on, I did get feedback from one volunteer who said, um, oh, what did she, I want to get her quote right, something like, oh, helping amphibians is something we can still do and it feels really good because it had been such a hard a hard year or you know start to the covid season um, but the other good thing about the amphibian migrations is as i said a lot of people go out with maybe just one other person and it would be pretty easy to keep your distance while you're out on the road you know six feet ten feet away from somebody else um, and uh, and to keep a mask on so hopefully if this is continuing into next year, it shouldn't cause any problems um, for volunteers to be able to participate. If we won't be, we, the last two years we've held in-person volunteer trainings. 
And that's something we won't be able to do most likely in 2021. Um, however, just fortuitously last year, we did record five modules for, for volunteers to watch on YouTube if they wanted to just train themselves from home. So uh, in hindsight, I'm so glad we did that because it'll really enable people to you know, engage and learn without having to show up at a, in an in-person training. Awesome, good to know that's still a priority. Um, someone is asking, is there any citizen science monitoring program or platform um, for amphibians or turtles such as eBird that there are for birds? That, if I could speak to the, to the terrapins, that's something that we're trying to address. I know at the New Jersey state level, um, we're looking for a system where all the programs will share some common data. And there's a, there is a citing um, form that you could fill out uh, through New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife uh, for anything in, in New Jersey. And it's basically, they use that for, for many other you know, reptiles and amphibians. So it's the same form, but we're trying to work on something to kind of standardize that for terrapins. And at the national level, there's, there's something called the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group. Um, and that's one of the things that we're talking about right now is, is looking at data collection and trying to standardize something. And that includes you know, citizen science, which is very important to us and observations. So we use something called iNaturalist um, and that is, is working out okay for us. Um, you know, and it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward and more universal. And we've kind of adapted it, especially in these COVID times for some of our you know, road, roadside volunteers. Um, so to answer your question, there's nothing standardized, but um, you can report a sighting in the state of New Jersey, you know, speaking to that. Um, yeah, I was gonna say just for general observations, I know that a lot of you know, amateur and professional naturalists use iNaturalist to log their observations for the purpose of our project. Um, thank you, uh, or thanks to um, uh, one of my colleagues that started working with us as an intern and we've been able to keep her on for a couple of years, Emma Clements, she took our paper data form and turned it into a, um, a survey one, two, three form that, that syncs up nicely with GIS, which has made our work a lot easier because we used to type stroke in everything on the computer, everything that everybody wrote on paper, we entered ourselves. So that saved us time. But um, because it, people are out in the pouring rain and they're pretty busy with their, you know, moving amphibians, I think having a phone to log in uh, anything directly is probably not ideal, which is why we still encourage everybody to keep notes on a paper form, but then enter it into a computer when they get back to their homes that, that night after the migration uh, volunteering is done. And I will say one thing I didn't really talk about that makes our project really challenging for volunteers to participate and why I'm so grateful to the ones who can is that we can't schedule it, right? We're completely at the mercy of the conditions. So, you know, we might suddenly see, oh, the forecast looks promising for Thursday night. So get your rain jacket and your flashlight and your safety vest ready. But we never know until like that day, that evening, even if it's gonna actually pan out. So. That's one of the trickier things. I'm always jealous of volunteer programs that can actually give people, you know, three weeks notice and mm -hmm. have them say the date in advance. Yeah, definitely something to consider. Um, this is from, where did it go? This is for Laura from Meg Sedano. I have, Friends tell me they have seen spotted salamanders out in the summertime when there was a lot of rain. Are there some individuals who don't go back to their woodland homes underground? Uh, good question. And hi, Meg. And I have to point out, Meg is the wonderful natural history artist who designed the, uh, or who drew the images on our little amphibian migration and road crossings kind of uh, unofficial logo. Um, she's, she gave us those drawings and we're really grateful. Um, and she was the illustrator for a great book called Salamander Sky, which I recommend everybody check out. But, um, but so Meg, um, 
uh, the the un, the kind of underground habitat um, usage is what they do during the day. They're nocturnal, so they're still out and about foraging throughout the year. Um, so it's really just in the winter when they're relatively inactive. But during the rest of the year, they'll be out on rainy evenings foraging. And so I know sometimes people will even see an odd one here or there during the day. In my experience, the only time I see them during the day is if I roll over a log in a moist you know, forest and I find one under the log. But I never see them walking around hunting for worms and insects you know, during the day. I think that that really is limited to nighttime. Um, so I don't know what the conditions were when your friend saw them, but certainly they're active um, throughout the, you know, the year, except for the winter. And I wanted to point out too, so the spotted salamander, the Jefferson and blue spotted salamanders, and the marbled salamander collectively are known um, as the mole salamanders because they go underground into mole-like tunnels. You know, they use these small mammal burrows from shrews and, and other uh, mole-like um, uh, small mammals. So um, that really speaks to this kind of underground behavior they have uh, during the daytime. I hope that answered my question. Everything is, <laughs> Everything is connected. I know I was thinking during your um, presentation that it's like the vernal pools themselves are a keystone species or something in the, in the ecosystem. Um, from Kevin Monroe, has the invasive red-eared slider had a negative effect on terrapins? And have either of you worked with, oh, well, I'll ask that later. Okay, it's a little bit different, but let's start with that one. Sure. Um we are seeing more sliders in, in some of our aquatic habitats, uh, but where our terrapins are occupying, actually they have a greater threat from snapping turtles. Um, snapping turtles are kind of making their way into some of the areas in Barnacid Bay. And we know that because when we're, we're doing our active trapping sessions, we know some areas where the terrapins are coming out into habitats that are normally terrapin habitats. So the, uh, the snapping turtles are going out and feeding opportunistically in the estuarine environment. And then they'll make their way back up into the streams, tributaries and rivers um, to more of the freshwater. Whereas the red-eared sliders are more, you know, uh, more stationed up in areas that are more freshwater. Um, so we haven't seen them kind of move down. Um, but in terms of uh, hobbyists and so forth, um, to speak to some of the calls we get, we get individuals that say, will you take our red-eared sliders, or we also have a terrapin, and it's it's housed with a slider. So we've seen some terrapins, you know, that are being kept, that are being kept in freshwater, and sometimes they're cohabitated with uh, with other, um, you know, turtle species that are more aquatic. Um, so that's the that's where we see that, you know, kind of overlap. But out in the wild, it's more of the snapping turtle. And John, just to clarify, what is the diamondback terrapin cylinder the tolerance range like would it, they would you ever see them kind of travel out to the ocean where it's salty super salty or we've seen them yeah that's a good question we've seen them at the uh, areas close to the inlets like where we work we're about a mile away from the barnegat inlet so our salinity values could be very close to that right along the coastal areas so we're talking about you know we're talking about salinity values along our coast that sometimes reach about 30 32 parts per thousand we have seen those conditions in areas where terrapins inhabit, but for the most part, they're in areas that have variable salinity. So when we get rainfall events or runoff, it really lowers that, that, that salinity down and they're able to obtain some of that water for their function, um, you know, especially rainwater and, and so forth. But yeah, they can be in some mix, but um, there's, there's a fallacy out there where they'll say, oh, those are freshwater terrapins or hobbyists will say, oh, they're freshwater terrapins. That's not, really the, the, the true you know, indication of a terrapin uh, being in fresh water. Uh, they can survive fresh water, but they're more susceptible to diseases uh, because there's a lot more diseases, fungus, ET, you know, ETC that kind of are in fresh water. Um, so you're, they're a little bit more susceptible and it reduces their function or ability um, to 
you know, uh, osmoregulate, which means process water and salt and so forth. So, you know, as they're growing, you know, it might lead to some, some underlying problems that we're not aware of if they're kept in fresh water too long. Good to know. Yeah, I think it's so interesting that the diamondback terrapins are taken from the wild for the pet trade and then you have the invasive red-eared sliders in this area people are supposed to have as pets, but they're releasing them and <laughs> um, <laughs> can't, can't keep it straight out there. Um, well, I was wondering, do you think that these terrapins that are sold in other areas are then, are they ending up with the same problem like we have with the red-eared sliders in this area? Are they being released in that, their non-native habitat? Well, in, in some cases, um, I know that uh, one of the one of the things they did years ago were because terrapins were were a, a food source for us back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, before the prohibition, and they used terrapins for stews and soups. But one of the things that they had to that they used as a main ingredient was cooking sherry wines uh, with the terrapin. But when the prohibition came about, they couldn't get the alcoholic beverages and the wine to cook them with, and they found out how terrible they tasted. So the demand in the United States declined significantly uh, after the pro prohibition. Um, but what happened was in the meantime, there was such a demand for terrapins that they tried to bring them to other habitats like on the west coast of the United States out in San Francisco Bay. And that just failed miserably. It just didn't take to that, that new habitat. So their range may increase, you know, as far as like um, climate change, warming, um, and it may expand the range, but to the north, we get more into a rocky habitat and they're more into um, a marsh kind of sandy kind of habitat. Where you find them up in Massachusetts, it's usually marsh wetlands um, and areas like Wellfleet, Massachusetts that have dunes and, and regular, regular sandy beaches and nesting areas. So I don't know how much far north they would go. So when you read, if you introduce them into other places, not even reintroduce them, but if you introduce them into other places, um, it's going to be it's going to be a challenge for them to survive and find suitable habitat. Makes sense. Um, going to just jump is also... in on... Oh, sorry, Haley. Just just that idea of illegal trade. Um, there's been um, operations with New York State DEC's environmental conservation officers where they actually had to go undercover to try to prevent this illegal trade of even species like spotted salamander, you know, and wood turtle, spotted turtle, um, you know, uh, timber rattlesnake is another reptile that's very vulnerable to collection. And, um, and they found that even at these amphibian and reptile shows, that are on the, you know, that are legit under the table, people had species that shouldn't be traded. And so when people often ask me, why is there no map on your website with all of the road crossings? That's mm -hmm. right. So um, we don't want to be publicly sharing information that's going to make these vulnerable species even more vulnerable. And um, yeah, but it was a pretty incredible undercover operation that those officers did to, to find, um, you know, these perpetrators. Well, good that they're out there doing that. Um, have, this is also from Kevin Monroe. Have either of you worked with indigenous peoples or First Nations peoples on um, herp conservation, maybe partnerships involving their reservation lands? I don't know if John, if you're about to say anything. No, no, go ahead, Laura, I'll let you go okay. first. Well, I was gonna say, I have not, um, you know, this project really, first of all, like I said, I don't actually get to do amphibian research. This project really relates to the work we do um, on community uh, land use planning. So one of the things that I saw was happening is sometimes we would have a town where the elected officials were actually really, um, pro-conservation of small wetlands like vernal pools. And they were trying to move forward like a local wetland law. And a lot of people would show up at the public hearing wondering why they were gonna regulate these small wetlands that looked like they were insignificant. And that's when I was like, oh, I see. 
we need to help other people understand why these habitats are so important. And so that was kind of the motivation with um, one of the motivators with starting this project. Um, and so that connection to um, kind of indigenous um, uh, populations and lands hasn't really organically come from this project, but I would love to learn about opportunities there might be to engage, um, you know, uh, other groups in this project or finding ways that maybe they could take advantage of some of the materials we've developed or for us to learn, um, you know, from them. So, but right now it's really been focused on municipal land use planning um, because it connects to the project we're doing in the estuary watershed with local municipalities. Yeah, the follow up too in New Jersey, when we were, um designating the uh, terrapin as a no harvest species, there were two pathways. Uh, one was through our New Jersey Department of Biomotor Protection because it was regulated, uh, regulated harvest, you know, through a certain time period um, and a certain size. And then it also was at the same time going through the New Jersey State Legislature. Uh, we, we were identifying some of the, you know, uh, issues with terrapins, but also terrapins as a resource uh, because culturally terrapins, like I said, were harvested, you know, as a food source. But we also had to explore and look at indigenous populations and how the terrapin may have been a resource and make sure that we, we, we were um, looking through you know, any type of historical documents and so forth before we kind of move forward um, to make sure um, that we were clear um, to, to protect the terrapin here. Um, so that was, that was you know, one of the things that we were thinking about as well. Uh, because it has been documented that you know they it was a resource an estuarine resource i have actually two of them right here <laughs> i i have uh, this is for haley because i know squirt's going to be joining you that's that's that, that that's a name that this one came with someone had it uh, and this is a hatchling that just emerged actually today from um, oh, some wow. of the eggs that we had that were over we kind of rescued from one of our sites because it was late in the season I have a chance to show them. But anyway, these are, you know, that, that was one of the issues that we had to deal with, um, looking, looking at, you know, our indigenous populations and then um, seeing how terrapins were, 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 were treated as a resource uh, before we made any actions. Um, awesome. Thanks for showing us those guys. Yeah, um, I guess we're breaking the news, but um, our education center will be getting a new animal soon. Um, so that's very exciting for us and everybody who's near the park can come check it out um, whenever we're able to open safely again. Um, so I just have one more question, I think, since we're running a little bit over, but it was so nice to um, have this discussion with you both. Uh, what is the biggest challenge and biggest advantage of having community science projects? We, I, I could speak to um, a number of uh, projects because we used to work with Earthwatch Institute um, with, in conjunction with Drexel University. And we had a you know, rotational series of, of citizen science. Um, we call them teams that would move through. Um, and for us, um, I guess the challenge looking at it from a standpoint, you know, in terms of collecting data is to make sure that everyone was well-trained and on board and they all had very consistent training and we're doing things in a consistent manner. So when you have those volunteers that are with a project for a longer period of time and they're you're like veterans, they really help to work with the others that are coming into the project, but also serve as a lead for those that are, that are learning and, and really kind of take those data uh, sets and, and, and information um, you know, in, in that, that credible format that, that, that are needed and if you have, let's just say, um, you know, we try to find different places for individuals because some may not be able to go out on the field and do that, but is there another means or something else that other individuals can feel like they're contributing while maybe not doing that? And I think that's a challenge, you know, for us especially, um, you know, because we're dealing with school groups and then I'm dealing mostly with like college interns and so forth, but I'm also trying to bring in people in our community so that they could be part of this and they're the greatest messengers, the greatest educators. Um, they are, they are where, where conservation really comes in from because they're right there, you know, at the level where you need it, where the where where it really needs to take hold. And I think that's a challenge for us is to 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 
bring new people in and make sure that they're you know contributing in a productive way. Um, so that that's that's something that you know we're always thinking about all the time. John, I actually worked with Earthwatch volunteers uh, on a mountain lion research project out in Idaho. And it was so fun just to get to meet people from all over the world who came out to help us with mountain lions. It was great. Um, but I would just say uh, in terms of uh, one of the positive aspects is as you probably you know, gathered from John's presentation and mine, there's all these very discouraging <laughs> you know, elements of conservation that can be really um, a downer. <laughs> you know, everything from habitat degradation to climate change and, you know, the crab pots, everything. And the volunteer participation is what makes me want to get out of bed in the morning and keep working in conservation. You know, knowing there's people who care so much and are so committed that they're willing to devote some of their, you know, precious personal time is, so rewarding. It's really what makes me, uh, it just inspires me all the time. So that's one thing I would say is a real positive side of these volunteer projects. Um, and for me, one of the challenges is that I have a lot of other competing responsibilities and I would love to just, you know, be able to devote so much time to this project. Um, and I don't get to spend as much time on it as I'd like, but um, it's partly, and one of the other things that's different with John, um, John's work is that this isn't a research project. So it wasn't designed with a research question where volunteers are going out to help answer a research question. So we can be a little bit less uh, rigorous in terms of um, how the data are collected. And, and um, but we try to, at least within some kind of parameters, keep it very standardized and uh, but certainly not having enough time, you know, to volunteer to um, train everybody in person um, is always a challenge. But um, but again, I, I'm more aware of the the benefits of just having all these other people who can be the spokespeople, can be the teachers, can continue, you know, passing along um, information. And also, I'm, what I'm hoping is they're the ones who are going to show up at the town hall when their elected officials are trying to put forward some kind of conservation plan and, and they'll speak up and support it. That's what I hope. Um, so it all ends up connecting. Haley, like you said earlier, it all is connected. And um, I'm hoping that's for how these volunteers interact with their own communities on conservation too. Great question. Yeah. Great. Um, so we will send out information on both of your projects. If anyone who's watching wants to get involved or find more information, um, you can look in your uh, inbox this week for more information on that. Is there anything else that either of you wanted to say tonight? Um, I am going to put it in the chat box. I wanted to point out that, um, oh, is that right? Uh, I think this is the right link. There is a, um, I worked uh, for five years for Hudsonia on biodiversity assessment and Eric Kiviat, uh, the director of Hudsonia and Liz Johnson from the American Museum of Natural History wrote a handbook on biodiversity in New York City some years ago. And there is a page or two in there on woodland pools. Um, and where you can see them in New York City. And so I thought um, folks might like to just take a look at that and also maybe learn about other habitats in New York City. Uh, so I'm hoping I put the right link in the chat. Oh, the link only works on my computer. Okay, wait, I, here's the other link. I think you have to actually go to the museum website first and then, um, and then you'll link to the, there we go. Sorry about that. Oh, great. Thanks, Thanks for sharing. An IT person. Yeah, that second one uh, should work. And I also, a little bit earlier, also put in the chat box the uh, links to the main Project Terrapin website, as well as the amphibian migration uh, road crossing project page underneath the DE stays. So uh, feel free to also peruse those as well. And in, in terms of terrapins, the Dimeback Terrapin Working Group uh, is going to be launching like a new, more user-friendly um, website. Um, and it'll have a lot of resources available on terrapins. And one of the things that I'm um, spearheading sometime 
you know, when I have some free time is to look at um, um, getting more educational, um, you know, type uh, programs and, and lessons um, about terrapins and their habitats. And, you know, it all kind of connects as Laura was just mentioning too, everything's kind of connected, um, you know, a lot of common, common, common themes tonight, you know, so, you know, just keep, be aware of those, those reptiles and amphibians. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, this was really personally very exciting for me. I mean, I have always loved reptiles and amphibians and have taken um, quite an interest in conservation or community conservation projects um, around our areas. So thank you so much for being here. I want to, on behalf of myself and Conservancy, um, thanks for taking your time to share your important work with us and our viewers. I hope everyone enjoyed this and I want to invite you to check out our other virtual and in-person activities coming up. You can find on our, um, our online resources related to reptiles and amphibians as well as other topics on our website. And we will be holding a family-friendly scavenger hunt in the park at Pier 1 on Tuesday and Thursday afternoon next week. Um, so you can find more information about that on our website as well. And we hope to see you all soon. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye.